we're talking about um, strategic communications. Um, so although I'm giving you a sector, uh, a job, an organisation that's specific to my experience, actually the principles and the ideas and the concepts are, um, I think, universal. So as you listen to what I have to say, I hope there will be things in there which you will recognise. Uh, so when I say uh, organisation, I don't necessarily mean a big company or something like this. It could be your unit, your immediate team. Uh, but the ideas and the approach, I hope, are going to be uh, applicable to specifically where you work. And I'm going to go through these really quickly because you'll have the copies of this afterwards if you want to review. Uh, and I want to minimise my time to um, maximise your speaking time. So really, um, this is about stepping back from day-to-day -day activities, the things we all do every day, and asking ourselves some of the bigger questions. What is it that your, you and your team and your organisation is really, most importantly, there to do? Um, do you recognise when you're succeeding? What is it that when does success give you that feedback and motivation to say, we did that really well, and now I want to get on and, and do even better? Um, in difficult times, being sustainable, you know, making sure that the work you do is still happening in five years' time is important for all of us, and we know it's, it's not easy, uh, given the current financial situation in particular. And what is it that's special about what you do? If you can convey to your trainees, those are the team colleagues, what it is that's almost unique about what you do, the benefit that your work brings, you're likely to have a more motivated uh, set of colleagues. So those are some of the questions. Um, we're going to try and look at this, we're going to try and look at this in terms of developing some concrete proposals to shape your thinking. So again, it, this, this won't be hard information, you must do it like this. This is about ideas to shape your thinking, your approach to your work. So I'm going to be talking about people with RMDs, rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. And we know that as a disease area and as a specialty, rheumatology, um, out there in the real world, there's a lot of ignorance. You know, you know of those conversations with people in the street and, you know, and family, etc., who a lot of the time don't, don't understand that osteoarthritis is a totally different sort of disease to rheumatoid arthritis. The politically and in terms of the media, we see these... Um, false assumptions coming back to us and we know it's a problem because it means our work is not recognised uh, for the value it brings specifically. And that confusion and negativity uh, applies also to, to politicians, to journalists, to general society. But actually, especially in my area of advocacy, sometimes that um, confusion you know, can be an opportunity. Because sometimes uh, a politician, in my case, for you it might be a, a senior manager you're trying to, to persuade. Actually, if you can bring together an argument, a proposal, which um, sets out the situation and your proposed solution, uh, and you have a good positive message to say, then actually that can bring clarification to the person who maybe was previously unsure about all of this. So in other words, um, a lot of people, especially people with budgets, want to hear positive things. And we're lucky now, compared to my experience as a child with juvenile arthritis back in the 1960s, we're lucky now we can talk about solutions, about things that we can do that make a difference to people's lives. We can talk about efficacious treatment, about self-management and so on. So we need to turn the old world assumptions that rheumatology and rheumatic diseases is a negative, nothing you can do about it disease into one of real opportunity. But to maximise the opportunity, certain things have to happen. And that's why I'm talking to you now, because actually if we all understand and share this view that positive things can happen to, if we agree the case, then actually we're more likely to succeed. Um, and to do this, you need to know exactly who to speak to, and you need to know how to speak to them, to reach them in the first place. Uh, and then, of course, be very clear about your goals and about success indicators. Um, if you're trying to pers persuade somebody to do something different, then what are the exact uh, success indicators you want to build in? 
So we know we can put together, if it's external communication to uh, the media, for example, or to people who are not working in our field, um, we've got pretty good uh, evidence now, obviously, about prevalence, about severity, um, but also, as I said, about the positive aspects of treatment and, and management these days, especially compared with the past. But this message needs to go wide. It's very difficult to run public awareness campaigns uh, and change attitudes at the macro scale. Uh, occasionally this happens. You remember the Australian uh, government funded a national TV uh, commercial campaign about skin cancer. The uh, slip, slap, slop thing. If you slip off your top for sunbathing, slap on your sun lotion. And it worked. It helped, in the short term at least, to reduce... Uh, the, the incidence of skin cancer because it, on everybody's TV every night. Most of the time, it's not going to be like that. Most of the time, we're going to make change happen through regular, constant communication, uh, which has to be very carefully constructed if it's going to be effective. And the, th the things that any case may, if you're speaking to your local uh, politician, if you're speaking to somebody who works in maybe in your health sector but not in, your, not in rheumatology, then you need your data, of course, your evidence. You need a rational argument. At the end of the conversation, the person you're talking to might not do anything about it, because maybe they can't. Um, but actually, if you've got a rational argument, they can't disrespect what you are saying, because it, it makes sense, even if they don't change their behaviour as a consequence. But more than anything, the human factor. Uh, certainly when I'm talking to, to politicians in Brussels, for example, it's so much different when there's somebody with the condition under discussion who can speak from the heart, from the first person, and, and can really bring to life what the disease means to someone in their everyday life when it comes to um, not being able to pick up a grandchild or when it comes to uh, relationships with, with husbands and wives, for example, or those little things day to day that politicians and others don't normally think about. Like the difficulties if you can't use uh, your fingers well about you know, cooking a meal or, or, or eating. These are the things that we take for granted, perhaps, but other people out there need uh, amplifying. So just a quick case study from an organisation, Arthritis Care in the UK patient group, where I worked. I'd been there for many years. As a chief executive coming in, the organisation had a terrible time. The members had become unhappy with some of the proposals. They thought that their traditional way of doing things was going to be taken away and everybody was going to be made to do you know, uh, self-management things. And it was all a bit of a, unfortunately, got a bit of a, a mess. So um, coming in to an organisation where there was uh, disharmony um, was a challenge. I have to say it was a challenge. And I learned a lot of the issues around good strategic communication from coming into quite a negative um, situation. And I felt the key here, and I think this is true in all situations, is, is good communication. Uh, you can't be a good leader without being a good communicator. Uh, and the good news is that you can always work on in communication skills to improve them. It's not something that only certain people possess. Uh, but both internally and externally, it's very important, I think, to, um, to show that you're listening to your, your colleagues. To re a bit like Jan said this morning, uh, and I'm sure repeated in the previous workshop, to reflect back to that person that what they are saying is going in and you are uh, uh, building it in to your, your work. So that's respectful. Uh, and I think building respect builds teamwork. And if you build teamwork, you're building a foundation for success. And if the opposite happens, you're more likely to fail. So these are the things which will help get to agreed priorities. And if those priorities are agreed, if everyone in the team has contributed to them, they're much more likely to be achieved because people will be more motivated. So in difficult situations, the first rule is don't panic. The second rule is communicate, consult, listen, but actually act. In the National Health Service in England, in terms of patient engagement, the usual formula uh, for hospitals and trusts to reflect back to the people what they've heard is a simple you said column and we did column. But not everything that people say can be acted on. But as long as you explain why, people will be um, respectful of the process and will continue 
to communicate with you. So the first principles really here are about um, reminding yourself why the work you do is so important and so special. And it is. You change lives. Everything, everybody in this room has an impact on the lives of other people in a positive way. Yeah, and yeah, we all make mistakes. We're not heroes, we're not angels. But you do incredible work. And sometimes, maybe in the, the day-to-day work, it's easy to forget that. So making a little bit of time to refresh your perspective and think about the impact you make and, and, and what the world would miss if you did not do your job or your team did not work in that way, I think is, is really important. Because everything else, all the other things around you know, equipment and budgets and governance, they're all important, but they're just a means to an end. And the end, of course, is helping people with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases to have a, a better life. So never assume in these communications. Always ask and check. Check that what you're saying is, is what, uh, what people have said to you. Uh, and make it clear to other people the, what, the, what the value of your work is. We can all take it for granted. It's easy to forget to quantify it and explain it. We should be shouting it from the rooftops because you do great things. But actually sometimes, I think rheumatology is a very modest specialty, is my opinion. Uh, and actually we don't, we should be less modest. And we should be shouting to people in an in in appropriate way um, just what great things can happen when rheumatology is supported uh, well. So um, working out what is special about your work, your role, and you, in talking to your colleagues and your trainees, helping them to understand what's distinctive, the added distinctive value that that person brings and that team brings and the, the unit brings is, I think, incredibly um, good fuel in the tank. It's the, it's the petrol that keeps the car moving in difficult times. It's motivation. So, as I said this morning in the first session, um, as a leader or manager or trainer, be good at who you are. Don't try and be anything else, because as soon as people see that discrepancy between what you really are and what you're trying to be, that's when uh, the problems may uh, arise. Um, you don't, there is no one leadership style. It's some kind of combination of qualities, I think, uh, involving authenticity, self-awareness, integrity, and not having expectations of other people that you wouldn't want to deliver yourself. Being consistent, I think, is really important. If you have those things, as a minimum, you will be respected. Uh, and probably you will be on the way to being an excellent leader. And reminding people all the time about their contribution, how that makes a difference, how it's being considered, and how actually, at the end of the day, it helps people in the real world. And getting concrete and specific about it. In my organisation in the past, I consulted huge 15,000 people consultation, but at the end of it, concrete objectives. This is now what we've agreed we're going to do. And over the course of 12 months, I can say that that disharmonious organisation united behind a five-year plan and I used to hear members coming, to, coming along to meetings quoting Objective 2. They liked it. They, they wanted, for example, people with arthritis to ben benefit more from government policies because it was their idea in the first place. And we'd found a way of making it part of the organisation's work by doing more advocacy, for example. Almost through now, I just want to say that even small victories are worth celebrating. Time is always against us. It's always the enemy. Sometimes we forget to, se to make little celebrations, uh, or even big celebrations, for small victories. Again, if you never do that, it seems like your work is just going down a, a bottomless pit. It's incredibly um, inspiring for colleagues, I think, when they can be helped to recognise genuinely that their work has already made a difference. So it, it's consensus building, it's getting shared agreement, it's a getting a common vision, uh, and it's recognising what you do is special, because it, it is. And finally, last slide for me, it's always good to be as concise as possible. I've probably tried to cover too much ground, uh, but nevertheless still want to leave you with the message that it's easy to just talk and talk and talk, and that's not necessarily the best way to either empower your colleagues or persuade people out there in the external world to come with you. It's much more respectful of them to shape your communications concisely. Uh, it's respectful of their time 
and they'll be more likely to want to help you. I'll stop there and pass to Ferry, if you'd like to come and add your thoughts, and then we'll, we'll, we'll both shut up and listen to what everybody else has to say. We are all very critical on this topic of leadership, so it should be simple and, and, um, and practical what to do and what not to do. And I, I heard many things that, that are relevant for the highlights that I'm thinking. You, you said trainees in the lead, yeah, that, that, that's very important. So that you only get that if you make a framework you can never talk into the blue, in the open blue skies. There should be competences, competences of a trainee in rheumatology is knowing about the molecular bas basis of disease, knowing about diagnosis, management, uh, prevention, speaking to patients, uh, empathic, um, being a teacher, innovate, healthcare, being a leader, well, there are many of these skills, competences, and, and make it precise. So if you, even leadership there, leadership of the trainee there, so what do you mean? And, and then, if you have that framework, then be practical and precise. And so, Next half year, you go to the outpatient clinic, or you go to the inpatient, or the rehab, or to uh, ultrasound course. So, what are your goals in these various competencies? What are you going to achieve? Write it down. Discuss half a year later. That's how you bring them in the lead, M make them their own leader. And and you with ultrasound. Yeah, I, I don't know about your country in ultrasound. I know Switzerland. But, but he's ambitious, so he wants more. And um, so that means show who you are, show your difference, what you make. In the end, everything in healthcare is politics. Politics is not for rats, it's for you. Decisions are only made on a certain level if information comes in. So be on that table, don't be on the menu, be on the table. And, and show what you can provide and, and speak up. And then via various pathways, you and your supervisor and the boss of the hospital, or the insurance company, or your scientific organization, they all should speak up for ultrasound. And in the end, maybe, I don't know your insurance system, but there may be, you, you may write bills about it or they may pay for the machine. I don't know. It's, it differs in every country. But in the end, decisions are being made and be part of this community. In the end, everything is a social affair. And, and leadership skills, yeah, you, you just, so leadership skills, several of you said, th there are personal things and there are um, s skills, objective things. And the personal things is, as Neil said, you get promoted till you get depressed. <laughs> and and I, I talk about walking in a split because you get only invited if you are a good professional, and if they like you, your teaching and your doctor and your, you write a paper, then they also ask you, you know, be supervisor of the trainees or be head of the outdoor patient clinic. And you get some responsibilities. If you do it good, but then still you have to be, you need your basis as a good doctor and teacher. And then it's getting more. And then the split gets wider. And you get into trouble. Because it, it's not rewarded, not in time, not in money. And they, the community looks at it in a very negative way, you know, management. It's not scientific. It, it is. On the other hand, there are intelligent people. They know that the 
atmosphere is the a good atmosphere is very important for your for your working place and that is determined by the coordinator so they know it but in the end it's very egalitarian among professionals so find your way in in that uh, community and and take care of yourself your time and your loneliness and your insecurity and make friendships and talk about it don't and don't work too hard <laughs> you know be, because working hard is not a solution it, it is do the right things right and and define where the problems are and who is the owner of the problem and spread that responsibility and don't absorb it yourself that is the human factor and the, and the, and the skills is well, choosing the right things. Neil said it. What is your mission? What is your vision? Wh why are you on earth? Why do you make the difference? Be very precise, because in the end, it, 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 it sounds very theoretical. You hear it now for the second time. But in the end, all these zillions of small decisions should have a basis. And they are deducted from why you are on earth. Why are you there? Yeah, to improve quality of care. Of course, that's good. <laughs> that's good. B but then, you know, that should then translate <coughs> in all this. She trains rheumatologists. You improve the skills in ultrasound. You want to be in research. Of course. And, um, and then that should be defined in, in a clear strategy, very, very precise. So there should be a framework for every discussion, because it's so heterogeneous. Training, education, ultrasound diagnostic, f good physicians, research, completely different fields. And you are together in the rheumatology group. So there should be a fair communication about how you judge the various Contributions should be fair. And to be fair, it should be evaluated every year in an open, fair discussion. And hopefully in a constructive way that you get support. Support for your own goals in the future. And as I said this morning, we are I, I said you are all dogs. Do you remember? It's very rough in medicine, very rough. If you compare that to the Royal Dutch Shell or Philips or Unilever, my friends are there. How they interact and support each other. Oh, it is so much better. We are so rough among each other. What are your goals this year? W what did you do? How can we support you? You are fantastic. The way you've done that, unbelievable good. When did you say that to your colleagues for the last time? <laughs> no. Do it! Yeah, that, and then, um, yeah, show your results. We, we have said that. And indeed, in, in the end, things uh, should change. And you should realize if, if you try to get a change, that, that we are all, there are all humans. So if you choose something according to your strategy, there's also always something that you don't choose. Every yes should be accompanied with a no. So if you choose this and say no to that, people who are on that side are not very happy. And they are your colleagues. We are not killers. So where are you? What can we do for you? It should be safe. And then you go forward and, and support. There are no carrots and sticks. Well, sticks, you should never be negative, never be derogative, never have raise your voice to somebody, secretary or assistant, or uh, well, never. And, and there's no money in university medical life to, to, to give. So, so it is recognition and support. 
help people and recognize that if they are on the no side, they go just like if they say you have a mama carcinoma or prostate cancer, we all know the faces, the emotional faces if they say that to you. It's the same with the no people. It is denial, f uh, grief, and then, uh, well, the, but the, it, it was said by the coach, that, that scheme, on her, one of her introductory slides. And so recognize that and adapt your communication skills according to their face. Be human. And then, of course, leadership in the end is all about integrity. So be predictable. And if you are in a team, the ultrasound team, and together you work on ultrasound. And if you are the three of you, you will never have complete the same ideas. So if somebody says this and you say that, there's a little friction in the team. Never talk about it outside that group. Never. If your colleagues hear from the man at the end of the corridor <coughs> about th that friction, it's a disaster. Never do that. And of course, on the top, if you have a, a discussion between four eyes, so your integrity is be soft on the people and be hard on the topic. Many skills, and well, there are, you can go on like this, uh, like th that coach talk. I like that coach introduction. <laughs> that you know, y there are so many things that you can learn, and coaching is just one of the topics involved in leadership. So read about it and, and uh, train yourself. I stop here. How to get research going. You said that? No? Who said it? You said it. Oh, yeah. Tja. Very difficult. Uh, yeah, talk in the group. Talk to the supervisor, the boss, and keep it simple. So I don't know. I don't know you, but you are a doctor, and you are a grown-up person. Maybe you have a partner and a family. Ooh. <laughs> So, count the hours of what you have available next to your family for work. And then count your responsibility you have to see patients, how many hours, you know, and, and then preparation, everything. Then they may ask you to do some teaching now and then, to have a shift, a uh, uh, night shift or now and then. Count the hours and then see how many hours you have left for research. And if I look at you, there are not many hours. Perhaps not that, but never enough. Never enough. So then be realistic. And you are your goals. You may set up a cohort. You may set up... Uh, specialized unit for scleroderma, I don't know what you're doing. But be realistic and match the number of hours you have with the ambition, otherwise you make yourself crazy. And that bring that on a, on a good scheme and present that to the group and present that to your supervisor and, and, and say, well, this is what I do. I hope the groups like it. I hope the external stakeholders like it. How they look at the group. Be, take care that the external stakeholders see it and that your contribution is recognized. So then if you are part of the community and everybody likes what you do, you start growing. Thank you.